our three speakers today, um, none of them wanted to give me a bio, none of them like pomp and circumstance. I was told that I should introduce them as the three amigos, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. They'll need to tell you which one is which. <laughs> So, on my right is Keith Phillips, who's the policy director at OFM, um, Drew Shirk, who I think might be a bit of a masochist. You all know that um, he was at the Department of Revenue for a number of years and interacted with us on revenue issues and then decided to take on a portfolio that would enable him to interact with us on a lot more issues. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I know we're looking forward to hearing from him. And um, Keith Phillips uh, is the new policy director, right? Yeah, the new policy director for, for the governor. So there's been a lot of movement for these jobs, and, and um, the governor's got good people working for him that I know that you're all very familiar with. So I'm not going through resumes. I'll let them talk, and I will stop talking. I don't know which of you even wants to start. So. I think Keith Phillips number one wants to start. Yeah. <laughs> Since we're interchangeable. Did I say Keith Phillips and yeah. Scott Merriman? Sorry about that. I'm Keith Phillips. Oh, yeah, <laughs> well. <laughs> See, I was thinking up. about it. What? So the real one stood up. The real one stood yeah. up, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm here or see, or, but I, you probably will think I'm evil. Um, <laughs> I'm Scott Merriman, not Keith Phillips. I'm at OFM in the budget office. The three of us work together, and you're going to learn a little more, little more about how we're doing business now. It's just slightly different, but it's the same faces. I'm going to talk quickly about the budget. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because David's coming back. It's either next week or in a couple weeks, and we'll do a deeper dive into both the operating budget and the capital budget and how we're proposing to pay for it. Um, so I'll just briefly describe the basic budget problem um, going into budget development. And for those of you that have never participated in budget development, it is a lengthy exercise. It starts in the summer with the agencies getting a set of instructions from the, gov from the budget office. They spend a lot of time working internally, working with their customers, clients, and stakeholders, and they present something to us in September, and we turn on the magic machine and start making decisions. Um, Going into the budget development, we had to figure out how are we going to pay for the existing government? Lots of all those activities that everybody wants, we had to figure out how we were going to pay for them with the revenues that were on the table. We needed to figure out how we were going to pay for collective bargaining. We were, this is the cycle where we go negotiate with the employees that are represented, whether they're in general government, higher ed, or for those of you that use the ferries on a regular basis, they are also represented. Um, and we also needed to figure out how we were going to pay for McCleary. It's not that town in Grays Harbor. It's that court order that we're all struggling with. So we laid out a range of ideas, solutions, some challenges for the governor. And I think we did that. Um, we did a lot of the busy work. And then when we, when we got to the hard part, we laid that out to him after he got done with his November job interview. And as before, he was getting ready to go on vacation and said, here are the tough things. Here are some ideas. Here's some paper. Go on vacation and decide. Not a great way to go on vacation is to have to go think about how you're going to do, make some of these tough decisions, because they are tough decisions. Um, you'll see in the budget, if you, if, if you are following the budget, some of you don't, some of you do, but in the operating budget, the key areas that there's focus on is in the mental health reform. Lots of conversations about how to reform the mental health system. We're under court orders to make some decisions there. Um, how are we going to reform the hospitals? We've got two big hospitals that deal with both civil patients and forensic patients. And the forensic patients are those that get there via the court, not whether you and I need to check in and get some help. Um, how we were going to deal with homelessness um, and the opioid issue. You all see it, it's around, it's everywhere. You see the camps, you see the people on the streets. We hear from a lot of the downtowns and the merchants downtown, we need help, we gotta figure this out. It is a growing issue on how to deal with homelessness and then McCleary. Let me talk a little bit about McCleary. The key things that are left to fix, because the legislature has done 
great work up to this point trying to solve the big parts of McCleary. What's left is teacher compensation, class sizes, um, how to deal with the opportunity gap, how to deal with career and technical education, how to deal with mentoring and the highly capable students as an example. You'll see legislation from us that proposes levy reform because that's one of the core questions that the court has posed that local school districts are relying too much on local property taxes. So there is a bill to reform the levy system. That bill will drive down local property taxes about $250 million. Drive down local property taxes for residents and businesses, $250 million. It will also put a new cap in place so we don't end up in the same spot that we're in. It will also continue to provide some flexibility for the school districts and the parents and the kids within those school districts to deal with the issues that are important to them, whether it's band or computers or science, things that are beyond basic education that are important to those, they'll still have that flexibility to deal with it. And or if they need to do different compensation because they may be in a high cost area. Um, so you'll, you'll see that. You'll see some bills dealing with mentoring. As the governor's been out there talking to teachers, spent a lot of time talking to teachers and principals and school districts, teachers who first start leave early because they sometimes struggle. And what they say is they need help with mentoring. So we're proposing to deal with some, or put some money in to help mentoring for teachers and principals. Let me talk about mental health. There's that hospital in Lakewood that has had lots of drama associated with it, whether there's been not enough staff or some difficult patients there. We're making great progress. We've put a lot more money into the staffing there. We were having a hard time finding nurses, doctors, and others that can work with those people because, frankly, we weren't paying enough. They were going to private hospitals or to the, to the, federal, to the federal system because we weren't competitive in a salary approach. I think we've turned the corner on that and we're almost back up to full staffing. We're on our way out of getting a, from Jeopardy from CMS. So that's a good thing. The proposal is to start moving people slowly out of the civil beds back into a community-based system, whether it's in private hospitals or private clinics and or new state facilities. So that's going to be a transition that will take some time to put these people back into the communities closer to where they are versus the two state hospitals. Homelessness, you'll see some substantive, so substantial investments in housing, transition housing, and those services to help them get off some of those addictions. Some of those addictions are driving some of those other decisions or choices. So then you're going to ask, how are we going to pay for this? And I know that's the tough conversation. We're, we've proposed a series of revenue ideas. Some of them you've seen. I don't think anything's new. They've all been around for a while. We're proposing a capital gains tax. We're proposing a carbon bill. Um, we're proposing an increase on the B&O service rate. And along with that, we would increase the thresholds for where you would have to file. I've got my tax expert here to help me, which is good. Um, and we're proposing to reduce some loopholes. And the, and the governor said to the legislature, I'm open for ideas. And I'll put the challenge on the table to you. Just saying no is not going to work. Come to the table with ideas and alternatives to help get out of this because we got to do it all together. I'll turn it over to Drew or Keith. You guys decide. No, I'm, I mean it. You got to bring down the tension of these things. Uh, good afternoon. Um, they say one of the toughest things to do is to change roles within the same organization, in the same institution. I'm actually looking at it in a different way. Um, there's very few jobs you can take where most of the people you see, you've seen before. Familiar faces. And that includes quite a few folks here in the room. And actually, my take on this is I hope with the broader role as policy and a lot of the learning I have to do and the digestion that has to go on just to get into the job, that at the end of that, I'll be able to be more engaged and reconnect with some of you on, on what you're doing. And I'm actually looking forward to that. That's the upside of this. But I do have a caveat. I'm not Matt. I wrote that into the contract. I am not Matt. Uh, by the time he left, 
he was the governor's policy director, the governor's legislative director, the governor's speech writer, the person responsible, responsible for the strategic planning at the enterprise level, and for the lead coach for the governor. Now, why his head didn't explode before then, I don't know. But I don't think any one person should attempt to replace Matt, which is why you know Drew, and he's here, and he's going to take a lot of those senior rel uh, relationships, especially with the legislature. Scott's been here forever and has done every job in the state except for the Supreme Court. Is that right? Correct. Right. Yeah, he hasn't done the court yet. Uh, between those two, they will manage the relationships on a day-to-day -day basis and be involved in that never-ending conversation, which is the legislative session. I'm going to peel off support to them, but also try to work with the policy advisors because I need to just get them out of the office. They know their portfolio. I would encourage you to go to them and solve problems, and I'm telling them that they need to solve problems. Now, that said, I, after 12 years, moved down the hall. Okay, There were a few spiders in my office. Uh, so you know where I live. And I would say, please find me. And just come find me if I can be helpful to you and what you're trying to accomplish on that, on that side. Uh, just a couple of things to point out, um, maybe just one story and one sort of new thing that's on the block and, and open to questions. About three days into the session, uh, one of the caucuses, who shall not be named, uh, asked us of all the things that the governor rolled out in December and that Scott just summarized, what things does he actually have to have before session can be over? What is your must-have list? Not your wish list, your must-have must list. We all kind of laughed because, uh, well, the governor's number one, and it's going to stay number one, is to fully fund education and finish that job. That doesn't mean he doesn't care about the things that Scott just mentioned. That doesn't mean he doesn't care about in the capital budget, school construction, buses, uh, water infrastructure. Governors are like that. It's not a matter of, I only care about one thing. I care about everything. Now let's get realistic on what you can get accomplished. We take the question we got, day three, what's your must-haves, as rehearsal for the end game. That's a good thing, because at least somebody's anticipating the end game. Uh, and then the, I think the new thing we're wrestling with and would be interested in your thoughts uh, whenever we have that opportunity is the new federal front. It's hard to know what the federal administration statements and actions in the last few days will mean uh, to us and to you. I don't know which ones you're tracking. We're watching them all. And every time something gets announced, three times a day yesterday, we get several thousand calls and emails that, Governor, rescue us. And you know we have to remind people on occasion that despite what uh, California Governor Brown said yesterday, we actually need some of that federal money and can't just do our own thing and launch our own climate satellite and go ahead and pay for all of our immigration costs if the feds pull out. We have to figure out how to do this together. The governor's take on this is it's too early for us to really know what the implications are for a lot of the, even the executive orders we've read, they're not all clear how they will turn out for practical implications to the state or in some cases to the country. And we're looking at that closely. We're trying to be a calming influence don't just blow it up and ask for replacement funding and assume that that's what we have to do immediately. At the same time, the governor is very concerned about a lot of what he's seeing, and uh, we are looking at the options, evaluating those. And if you have ideas on how to deal with specific concrete actions that have led to certain implications to your businesses in the state, let us know if we can put it in the list of things we can do either on the administrative, on the policy, or on the budget front. And I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Drew and say thank you for having me. Well, I'm back. <laughs> um, it was a big transition, obviously. Many of you have worked with me for many years while I was at the Department of Revenue. And it was a great, op great experience in sort of maybe preparing me for this challenge. I don't know that taking on this role two days uh, before the session starts is the best uh, strategy for success, uh, but that's the one I have. And, and, and my thought with it is, well, the expectations are so low, there's, it's impossible, right? You can't start two days before session and be successful. So maybe the bar is really low, right? And, uh, and I'll skate a, a little bit. Uh, somehow I don't know that that uh, will be the case. Um, one of the things that I, I want to talk a little bit about is, is, you know, coming over from revenue, one of the things that I tried to do while there, and one of the things that I want to continue to do while working for the governor is, I, 
I've always tried to be approachable, accessible. You can always talk to me. I'm focused on solutions because I think that's what we have to do here. We can, we can talk a lot about differences and um, what we don't agree on, and we won't get anything done. I've always believed that with sort of big issues and big problems, there's big opportunities. And you have to leverage those opportunities to, 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 to move the ball forward. And so that's my strategy, and that's one of the things that I want to do, and I, and I open that and offer that to you as well. Um, you know, seek me out. Um, I'm going to try to break out of the corner office as much as I can. It's a real challenge, I will tell you, that is really hard to do because there's a lot of demands that go on with the governor, and um, so being available and accessible is one of those things that I uh, am committed to working on. And so uh, I invite you to, to, to reach out to me because I, I do want to hear about your issues and challenges that you're dealing with. So, so far, you know, it's been, I guess, three weeks now, and um, we've had some, it's been really eye-opening. It's been very interesting. Well, I've met, uh, dealt with almost all the legislators on many issues over the years, it's a really unique experience to come in when you meet it and representing the governor. And I will tell you, people are very honest, they're very direct, and they tell you what they like and what they don't like about the governor and the governor's policies. And so having, uh, learning how to, to communicate in that environment is, is really very, very interesting. Uh, but I also think it's going to be sort of exciting uh, to take on. So what have we been doing? Uh, the governor has, has had a full agenda of meetings. We've been meeting with legislators on almost, almost every issue that's, uh, that's been out there. We've had a lot of conversations about McCleary and obviously education and getting uh, those um, plans out on the table so that we know, you know what, what's the size of the universe we're dealing with when we're talking about McCleary. And uh, very hopeful that the Senate comes out with their plan. I believe it's here in the next few days. And so we can see that uh, part of it and start moving that forward. Because once we identify McCleary, we can identify a lot of the other pieces that have to go into play. We're also having a lot of conversations about the budget, obviously, and meeting with folks on how to resolve that. And, and Scott talked a lot about that. Uh, uh, mental health issues, we're, we've had uh, meetings on those things. Uh, clearly the CBA issues are out there, uh, the Blue Ribbon Commission on Early Learning, uh, the list goes on and on, and the governor's been having uh, regular meetings on those issues uh, on a daily basis. And so uh, that's been very helpful, and we've had good uh, bipartisan conversations with folks. We're having very open um, dialogue, and people are meeting with the governor and being uh, very straight up with their communication with him, which I think is great. Uh, one of the things, that, as I mentioned, you know, obviously with the challenge that we have, and you know, everybody looks at this almost this year is almost an impossible uh, challenge. Um, but as I said, you know, there's opportunities in that, but that means compromise, and we're all going to have to compromise. We recognize that, uh, and I'm I know the legislature recognizes that. And so in that compromise, what does that mean? And I think we have to get creative about that. That sometimes we can get stuck into a single dialogue about a, a single issue. And sometimes expanding the scope of that conversation will allow us to actually bring in different pieces together and actually create solutions. So I, I, I challenge everyone and I urge everyone to, to, to be creative about that and, and, and to be open to other solutions to help people uh, achieve. And everyone's got to get a little something out of it. There's just no two ways around it. There can't be a zero-sum game of only winners and losers. It has to be, it has to be a compromise. Um, you know, some of the other things that we've had uh, conversations about, and I think that it will be important for you to, to be aware of, um, uh, you know, aside from the education and the McCleary issues, you know, this Levy Cliff issue is a big issue, and we're going to be hearing about it a lot in the next week. And so um, what does that mean, and how does that come into play with the whole McCleary solution? So uh, we're going to have to have uh, some, some, probably some tough conversations here over the next little while. Um, Water and environment. Uh, water has been on the table, and there's a lot of big water issues. It's really important to, to, to the state. We've had some big court decisions out there that are critical, and uh, we have some uh, big infrastructure projects that people want to look at. So how does water play into all of this? Um, economic development, uh, and a lot of conversation about rural economic development. So what are those ideas? And if people have ideas around what we can do on rural economic development, then you know, bring them forward. This is the time to, to, to identify those things so that we can see what opportunities are there. So I throw that out. Um, as, as both have mentioned, we have the federal challenges. You know? um, the governor's going to be uh, really focused on uh, what, what the impacts on the Affordable Care Act are. And, and that's huge impact of 750,000 citizens in Washington who are dependent on that. And what does that mean for us? And so uh, having an eye on that. 
uh, this week, the DREAM Act uh, is very important too. We have a lot of kids in college who are dependent on that. So how do we, how do we manage that? One of the things that I would urge in reactions to the federal government, we don't know how it's going to play out. I think we have to focus on the, act, on the actions and not on the, on the, um, on the, con, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, I don't know, the, the verb, the rhetoric, the rhetoric, exactly, that goes about that, uh, the tweets. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we can get sidetracked on the tweets. I think we have to really focus on the actions. And I think it's more important than ever um, uh, because I think sometimes those could be two separate conversations. Uh, and the last thing that I bring up um, is uh, there, there's a lot of conversation at the federal level about infrastructure investment. What does that mean for us? What opportunities are there? So we need to be focusing on that. So as with anything, it, it seems very challenging. It seems daunting. But I also think that this is a chance when you actually can do big things and we can make a difference. And I think that's what's important. And so that's where I'm going to be focusing my energy is, is on trying to uh, create opportunities and, and, and get some success for all of us. So uh, with that, um, I throw it out. We could have questions for.